This incarnation of the divine being or the fact that it essentially and directly has the shape of self-consciousness is the simple content of the absolute religion. In this religion, the divine being is known as spirit or this religion is the consciousness of the divine being that it is spirit. For spirit is the knowledge of oneself in the externalization of oneself, the being that is the movement of retaining its self-identity in its otherness. This, however, is substance insofar as substance is in its accidents at the same time reflected into itself, not indifferent to them as to something unessential or present in them as in an alien element, but in them as it is within itself. That is insofar as it is subject or self. Consequently, in this religion, the divine being is revealed. It's being revealed obviously consists in this, that what it is, is known. But it is known precisely in its being known as spirit, as a being that is essentially a self-conscious being. For there is something hidden from consciousness in its object, if the object is for consciousness in other or something alien, and if it does not know it as its own self. This concealment ceases when the absolute being qua spirit is the object of consciousness. For then the object has the form of self in its relation to consciousness. That is consciousness knows itself immediately in the object or is manifest to itself in the object. Consciousness is manifest to itself only in its own certainty of itself. Its object now is the self, but the self is nothing alien. On the contrary, it is the indissoluble unity with itself, the universal that is immediately such. It is the pure notion, pure thought, or being for self, which is immediately being, and consequently being for another. And as this being for another, it is immediately returned into itself and in communion with itself. It is therefore that which is truly and alone revealed. The good, the righteous, the holy, creator of heaven and earth, and so on, are predicates of a subject. Universal moments, which have their support on this point, and only are when consciousness withdraws into thought. As long as it is they that are known, their ground and essence, the subject itself is not yet revealed. And similarly, the determinations of the universal are not this universal itself. The subject itself, and consequently this pure universal too, is, however, revealed as self. For this is just this inner being which is reflected into itself and which is immediately present and is the self-certainty of the self for which it is present. This, to be in accordance with its notion, that which is revealed, this is then the, the true shape of spirit, and this is its shape, the notion, is like, likewise alone its essence and its substance. Spirit is known as self-consciousness, and to this self-consciousness it is immediately revealed, for spirit is this self-consciousness itself. The divine nature is the same as the human, and it is this unity that is beheld. Paragraph 759 is a long one. There's a lot going on in it, and I would like to highlight from the beginning what happens at the beginning and what happens at the end, where Hegel is, you could say, tipping his hand, letting us see uh, when that metaphor, what cards he actually does have in the hand. They haven't yet been completely played, but if we have these things in mind, we can see where this section of the revealed religion and of the religion section in general is actually going. This is a very important set of points. So he begins with this interesting word that gets translated here as <clears throat> incarnation by Miller. And, you know, it's, it's fitting. I mean, typically we think of incarnation as God taking on human shape and it literally means taking on flesh, right? Taking on the body, the kind of thing that we ourselves are, although there's a lot more to it as well. I mean, we are also self-consciousness, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment as well. But 
there's an earlier, not necessarily earlier sense, but certainly a connected sense, God becoming human, God becoming man is often how it's, it's framed. You could think to, you know, the cur deus homo of St. Anselm, which is not the first attempt to provide some sort of, you know, look inside the mechanics of the, not just universe and creation and its fall and redemption, but why it is and how it is that the divine not only can, but should become human, completely human, right? And we're going to see a reiteration of this a little bit later towards the end when Hegel is telling us that the divine nature is the same, das Alba, right? As the human, menschliche, right? And it is this unity that is beheld, that is intuited, <clears throat> that is being grasped in sensuous forms as well as cognitively and affectively. Now, in traditional Christianity, it's not that the divine and the human nature are the same, although you could say, well, they are the same in the incarnated God, the God human, right? Uh, in this case, Christ. But we want to avoid a confusion here of saying, well, human nature is the same thing as divine nature. But this kind of signals where, where Hegel's going. Because here's where, in some respects, he's, he's different than traditional Christians, right? Um, we're looking ahead towards seeing the human community as being the divine. But that's further down the line. So let's put that off for the moment. I mentioned, you know, this is just how he's tipping his hand to some degree. Let's go back to that first discussion. This incarnation of what? The divine being. Actually, it's not divine being at that point. Uh, Miller is transposing the word divine in there. It's just evasion, right? Um, but Later on, that's going to be das gütliche Wesen. So, you know, it's okay. It's not a, not a big deal. Uh, what being are we talking about here? The divine being, right? So the incarnation of the divine being. Now, what does this actually mean? It says, or the fact that it essentially and directly has the shape of self-consciousness this is the simple content, the Einfach Inhalt, right, of what Hegel here is now calling the absolute religion. Now, absolute is at a higher level, the revealed religion in relation to nature, religion, and the religion of art, what we could call the religions of the world in other ways, and the religions of the Greco-Roman complex, uh, you know, throughout history, going into to theater, drama, that sort of thing. Uh, that is being revealed as important, but not the absolute religion. The absolute religion is going to be one of Offenbarung, revelation. Revelation in what sense? Re revelation to whom? Revelation, even more importantly, processed and worked through in what ways? Well, this is what it lies in the many paragraphs ahead. So he says that uh, the incarnation is the simple content of the absolute religion. How do we make sense out of this incarnation then? Well, it has the shape of self-consciousness, the form of a self-conscious being, which exists for other self-consciousnesses like ourselves. So then he says, in this religion, in this kind of religion, the divine being is known as spirit, geist, right? Um, for spirit is the knowledge of oneself in the externalization of oneself. So this is something important about spirit, not something, you know, radically new, something that Hegel's been talking about, knowing the self by externalizing the self, 
This is how we actually do come to make sense of what it is that, that we are. And so to other beings as well, and we can compare and contrast to each other. We're all externalizing to some degree. And we have to, by the way, as self-consciousness is because as we know from the self-consciousness section, self-consciousness is self-consciousness in relation to another self-consciousness. So there always has to be some, some othering, some externalization going on. Now he says the being that is the movement of retaining its self identity, what, what it, it knows itself to be in its otherness. And this is, you know, typical Hegelian stuff. Things are related to their others. Self-consciousness is like that. Spirit is like that. What do we have going on? So he says this, however, is substance. So, um, as in the previous paragraphs, we're going to see a lot of S words, right? A lot of things coming up that are connected to each other, that reveal or transform into each other. And so we're going to have substance. We're going to have not self-consciousness per se, but self-conscious being. We are going to have the subject and then we are going to have the self. So four S's there, right? We, five if we want to count spirits, right? And, uh, you know, these are, these, these four are S's in the German, but spirit Geist, of course, is not, but five in, in the English, right? So what's going on here in terms of substance? So he says, this spirit, right, is substance. Insofar as substance is in its accidents, so we'll come back to that in a moment, um, at the same time reflected into itself, not indifferent to them as something unessential or present in them as in an alien element, but in them it is within itself. Okay, so what are we talking about as substance there? So a substance is something that remains uh, not necessarily the same because its accidents could be changing, but it remains the same substance through time. So I am a substance, you're a substance, you know, this chalkboard is a substance. Um, the lights that I'm using to illuminate uh, this as I talk to you are a substance. We can break substances down further into, you know, in the human body, organs, which... Are they substances or not? Well, it depends. You know, like Aristotle says, a hand cut off is not really a hand in anything other than an equivocal sense. But suffice it to say, we have, we have substances and substances do have accidents. That is things about them that do change. So um, Aristotle had a whole, you know, list of uh, accidental categories. That is things that are contingent, things that happen to be the case. And some of these could even be things that seem to go very deep, like being a good person or a bad person. Um, Hegel, by the way, is un, you know, he's unwilling to follow along with a substance ontology where substances are what they are in themselves and don't really change. I mean, we do, in fact, change through some of our accidents. Even Aristotle recognized some absent, uh, some accidents are proper accidents and others like wearing a pink tie are you know pretty contingent right so let's come back to this so substance is in its accidents reflected into itself why is he bringing that up well spirit as substance knows itself through its accidents you might say sometimes this happens through just, you know, scrutiny of self. Sometimes this happens through, you know, seeing it through the eyes of the other self-consciousness or hearing their reports about it. Sometimes it happens through doing something. Let me try on this pink tie. Not a color I would typically wear, but oh, it looks, looks good actually. And then I can think about other things connected with it. Oh, pink is associated with uh, femininity or, you know, things like that. And yet, historically, that's a new thing. That's a 20th century thing. Because in the Middle Ages, this was one of, pink was one of the most dynamic and masculine of colors. And you notice all these things that are packed 
into just that one little thing, that one accident right there having to do with this substance, which I am using as something accidental for myself. When I put it around my neck, I am the substance in this case. We could go on and on and on with examples of how it is that a substance can be reflected into itself through its accidents, not indifferent to them, not indifferent to them, meaning that it, it, you know, the substance is itself in some way affected by its accidents in itself, right? Um, not indifferent to them as something unessential or present in them as in an alien element. Um, what does that last part mean? The substance is not in its qualities, its attributes, its predicates or determinations, as we're going to see a little bit later, as something merely contingent. Eh, it just so happens that this hair <laughs> of this color uh, on my, my face and my, my head is um, attached to this person, right? No, I, I live in that. I live in my accidents. And so do other beings. And so he goes on and says, in them, in these accidents, it is, the substance is within itself. And here we can now get to the next thing. That is, insofar as it is subject or self, which we're going to come to very soon. Then he goes on, and consequently, in this religion, the divine being is revealed. Often bar, right? It is. It is shown. It, it. It actually. It doesn't. It isn't just revealed. It reveals itself. Right? This, this is even more important as well. It's revealing itself as another human self consciousness, as well as divine, right? So he says it's being revealed. And there is obviously consists in this that what it is is known. Okay, that, that is pretty obvious. Revelation has to do with knowledge, right? And then he says, but it is known precisely in its being known as spirit. What is that now? Now we get to the next one. That is essentially a self-conscious being. Wesentlich Selbstbewusstsein. Not just selbst, uh, you know, bewusst, uh, self-conscious, right? But Selbstbewusstsein, uh, a self-conscious being. So we've gone now from substance to self-conscious being. It is both at the same time. It's also still spirit. And he says, um, there is something hidden from consciousness. In its object, Gegenstand, if the object is for consciousness, an other or something alien, and if it does not know it as its own self, this concealment ceases when the absolute being qua spirit is the object of consciousness. Right, so the absolute being here is the divine being that is being incarnated, being made human, and we, the believer, the other self-conscious being is grasping that as a, another self-conscious being in relation to ourselves, to, to whom we could open up space within our own consciousness to allow it in as when we know it, as when we develop intimacy with it, as when we have desire for, which is Hegel's not talking about here, but desire for what? For recognition from that divine being and to recognize that divine being. So he goes on and he says, um, this, this concealment ceases when the absolute being qua spirit is the object of consciousness. For then, the object, the absolute being, has the form of self in relation to consciousness. Consciousness knows itself immediately in the object or is manifest to itself in the object. Now he tells us a few really important, interesting things here. Consciousness is manifest to itself only in its own certainty of itself. Its object now is the self, 
but the self is nothing alien or foreign. On the contrary, it is this indissoluble unity with itself, the universal that is immediately such. It is the pure reine notion, begriff, pure thought, or, and here we get some interesting transitions, it's being for self. In the previous paragraphs, we saw a lot of references to the Anzik sein, right? Or Anzik. Now we have the Fürsik. And here it's explicitly Fürsik sein, right? Being for itself, um, it being related to itself. And this, he, he says, this is very, very interesting. This is immediately being, unmittelbares sein, right? So there is an overcoming of mediation happening here um, that is occurring through the self-certainty, the being certain, being conscious of oneself and what's in oneself, right? So he goes on and he, he says here, it, uh, it is pure notion, pure thought, or being for self, which is immediately being, and consequently being for another. And as this being for another is immediately returned into itself and in communion with itself. It is therefore that which is truly and alone revealed. Well, why being for self becomes being for an other? Well, because others are there, other self-consciousnesses. But now notice that it's not like, you know, oh, there's that other self-consciousness over there. It wants to enslave me. It won't recognize me the way I want. No. In the revealed religion with this incarnate God, human nature and divine nature being the same, there is a different relation of self-consciousness to it. The believer is in a certain way, we could, Hegel doesn't say this here, but we could say inhabited by the other self-consciousness, the divine and human self-consciousness. That is how there is this communion with itself. And that's why he says, it is therefore that which is truly and alone revealed, the revelation of the incarnate God. Here's where we go to yet another level, subject. The good, the righteous, the holy, creator of heaven and earth, and so on, he says. Now, what are these? These are the things that we say about God. These are things that we even put into creeds. Credos uh, are I believe assemblages, right? We say, I believe, or the church believes, or we, the community, believe, we, spirit, believe, this, 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 you know, I believe in one God, the, you know, creator of heaven and earth, uh, all that is seen and unseen. Those are, those are saying things about what you believe about that God. And, you know, one of them is in here, right? Creator of heaven and earth, right from the uh, creeds, uh, the holy, the good, the righteous, the transcendent, whatever it is, being, goodness, right? These, he says, are predicates. A little bit later, he's going to use the word determinations, uh, right? Of a subject. Universal moments, he says, which have their support on this point and only are when consciousness withdraws into thought, as long it is, as it is they that are known, the ground in essence, the subject itself is not revealed. And here we have, we're going back in a certain way to what was just said earlier about having this hiddenness or having something that uh, is not known, right? So this is another way of talking about that. So long as our understanding of God is coming through all these predicates or determinations, which are known both in the sense of like an individual believer says that, that they know it and they're known to a community and tradition that uh, antedates the believer and probably will continue on in the you know worldly way after the believer is, is dead. Well, people do get really wrapped up in this and they lose sight of the fact that the divine is a subject, not just a subject of conversation, <laughs> 
not just something for us to be, you know, making ourselves subjects of or to subject in, in our own way. Like when we think that we're better than God and we get to boss God around, God must be this way, this way, this way, right? We, we're arguing about predicates. God is a subject in that God has agency and God has personality. God is menschliche, right? This is a menschwerdung, a, a becoming human, becoming humanity, becoming like us, poor slobs. Right? There was that uh, great song years and years and years ago. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us, right? Uh, what does it mean to actually become humanity, you know? Well, that is the, the subject that is to be revealed, to reveal itself, to, to open itself up, you know, open borrowing again, right? So he goes on and he says that um, as long as they, it is they that are known, their ground and essence, the subject is not yet revealed. Similarly, the determinations of the universal are not this universal itself. The subject itself, and consequently this pure universal too, here we get now the fourth thing, is, however, revealed as self, selbst. For this is just this inner being which is reflected into itself and which is immediately present, present as somebody that we, as we saw earlier, can, can touch, can see, can hear, can feel, right? can have relations with, can eat fish with, right? to take a prime example. Um, Reveal the self, for it is just this inner being which is reflected into itself and which is immediately present and is the self-certainty of the self for which it is present. There's a lot of selves going on in there, right? So you have to think of that in terms of, again, the believer and the religious object, Gegenstand, which turns out to be a subject and turns out to be a self as well as self, self-consciousness and substance. So it goes on and he says this to be in accordance with its notion, that which is revealed, this is then the true shape of spirit. And this its shape, the notion, the begriff, is likewise alone its essence and its substance. Spirit is known as self-consciousness, and to this self-consciousness, it is immediately revealed. So we've got two self-consciousnesses there. Spirit is known as self-consciousness, both the self-consciousness of the incarnate God and my own self-consciousness, and right um, to this self-consciousness, me, it is immediately revealed, for spirit is this self-consciousness itself. Self-consciousness is being used here in a kind of different way, isn't it? Self-consciousness is not just two self-consciousnesses which exist in relation to each other, but it is something also that connects these two self-consciousnesses and provides what's going to be a ground for the recognition that we're looking for. Here's where he ends. The divine nature is the same as the human, and it is this unity that is beheld, right? So we, we go from the incarnation of the divine being to now the divine nature is the same as the human, why? Well, Hegel's deployed all of this metaphysical language or apparatus to make sense of this as he's steering us towards what theologians have called the Christ event, the entrance of, as you know, Kierkegaard in Philosophical Fragments puts it, of the eternal into time. And we could say, indeed, into humanity, 